Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. It's my pleasure. We're going to have a plenary session now, three talks before for lunch break, uh, and it's my pleasure to introduce the first one. This is Bill Howe from the University of Washington, where he is a, a research scientist in the eScience Institute, and you have another appointment in computer science as well. And uh, Bill's been doing always uh, great work in cloud computing and eScience, and so take it away, Bill. Thanks, Dennis. So in just a few minutes that I have, I just want to try to convince you all to spend more time on declarative query, which I guess database flavored people in the crowd will probably already get this, but I find that there's fewer of those than maybe there should be. So I'm gonna to try to make this argument. So I've been trying to think about how to, how to pitch this. And so one thing I think about sometimes is this needs hierarchy that you might've heard from, from psychology, right? So this is in 1943, this guy Maslow sort of argued that how you pursue your needs is follows this, this structure originally it's sort of you know at the bottom it's sort of food and water and sleep and so forth and then safety and so on up up into uh, what he calls self-actualization so as each need is satisfied the next higher level of the hierarchy dominates conscious functioning and i think there's probably a similar needs hierarchy for for scientific uh data management uh, i'm not gonna spend too much by the way i'm not gonna spend too much time arguing for data intensive science because a we just heard a keynote and b i think people are pretty familiar with that in the context even though i might typically in this venue because it's specifically cloud features as opposed to uh, science in the cloud. Okay, so what is, what is maybe my analog of, of, of this needs hierarchy? Well, you know, at the bottom you have storage, and once you have storage, you want to sort of share that. Once you can store data comfortably, you start to share it. And then once you can share the data, I claim you, you're going to want to query it. And once you can query, you're going to do sort of analytics. And then at the top is semantic integration. Okay. Now, I, I think that the big mistake made by computer scientists and where we sort of disagree with domain scientists is that we try to do this instead. We try to argue that semantic integration is a prerequisite for uh, query and therefore analytics. And I, and I think decoupling uh, a declarative query from semantic integration uh, is powerful in that it gives uh, a scientist another tool in their toolbox with which to do this other work. And so I claim that this top, back to this one, you know, the top level is a, is a integrated model of the world where that you can sort of, uh, you can, so you can understand the world around you. So that's the goal, not a, not a, you know, preamble to the goal as we try to think of it as. So in, in practical terms, this means, you know, somehow we have to sort of get out of the practice of design a carefully engineered schema first, then load the data, then start querying it. Okay, and so I'm gonna talk a little bit about a system where we try to sort of do that decoupling. Okay, does that seem controversial, does that make sense? Anybody hate that? No, some people see it. Anybody wanna argue? I will right, we'll do it offline. I'll keep going. Uh, let me let me uh, let me make a couple more points, and then we'll. Uh, I, I, that's not going to be the least controversial thing I say, probably. So, so okay. So, how do we actually get this done? Well, I to a first approximation, I claim that sharing and storage are solved. So that may be also be a controversial thing to say, right? So we 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 have these wonderful systems in the cloud where you can sort of put data up. Uh, sustainability models are maybe difficult. Funding is maybe difficult. Uh, there's some culture issues to try to get scientists to use this, but these systems exist and they're useful. And you know, they're also uh, universally accessible, so sharing in some sense is solved. And increasingly, you're sort of seeing uh, query services move over to the cloud too, and I'll talk a, a little bit about that. On the other side though, these analytics and semantic integration, while there are uh, services available in the cloud, they tend to be pretty siloed in my opinion, right? They're, they're very, uh, well, in my observation, I, sp I should say. Uh, you know, so, so they're application specific, they're working with a specific, uh, 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 you know, some of the ones we just heard about from, from Joe, it takes, a, it takes an effort uh, of highly trained computer scientists working directly with scientists in order to build these things, and it's not clear how much of that is going to be reusable. So I, in some sense, this query layer may act as the glue uh, to connect these two up. Okay. All right. So maybe my goal is to expose all the world's science data through appropriate declarative query interfaces, right? This may not be SQL, this may not be, uh, it's probably relational algebra based, uh, and I'm not gonna talk too much about that. We're gonna probably assume SQL for now, but that's not, I'm not necessarily uh, married to the idea of, of SQL. Okay, so this is already happening. People are already sort of exploring this idea, mostly in the database community. 
you have maybe this inner circle is things that are already sort of accessible or expressible via declarative query languages. And of course, there's relational data. And there's tasks that are obviously expressible in relational algebra, you know, select projection joins. And there was a lot of work for many years on, on you know, bringing streams into this circle, a lot of work for many years on bringing XML into this circle. Uh, but there's things that are maybe outside this circle, right? There's sort of really, really, really large data. Uh, and, you know, MapReduce and Hadoop and so forth have been attacking that problem perhaps independently of, of declarative query languages, although increasingly you see those uh, types of languages being layered on top of Hadoop. Uh, you know, and then there's a, a higher level analytics besides just basic data manipulation that are perhaps outside the circle. Maybe what I call dark data, which is all the data that's kind of messy and stored away on somebody's laptop, especially in the sciences, you see this a lot. Uh, and so that's kind of, kind of inaccessible, partially because of the, the schema uh, first reasons that I just described. Uh, similarly with spreadsheets, a lot, of, a lot of science data and a lot of business data for that matter is stored in spreadsheets. Uh, and it's not necessarily trivial to uh, extract the information and put it into a, relational, into a database of some kind or expose it through declarative query language. I don't really want to say put it, I'm trying to avoid using the term put it into a database because that's not really what I mean. I mean expose it through declarative query interfaces, which may or may not involve uh, a database uh, otherwise. Uh, HPC type of work, uh, graph query and so on. So this, but again, some of this stuff is being done. So as I said, you know, you see uh, pig, which is essentially a relational algebra language layered on top of Hadoop. You see Hive, which is SQL. You see other kinds of languages that maybe arguably aren't, are, we can quibble about uh, imperative versus declarative, but they're certainly higher level of, uh, levels of abstraction for the low level uh, uh, um, uh, distributed programming models. So that's, that's maybe on its way. Uh, you see analytics even happening here, right? So, so uh, Joe Hellerstein here at Berkeley, not, not the keynote, not, the, not, the, not Joe from Google, uh, has this project called Mad Lib where they sort of argue that you can express, uh, you know, matrix multiplication, other kinds of analytics tools in relational algebra, and actually there's a good reason for doing so. Chris Ray, who was a student at University of Washington, is now uh, uh, is now working on trying to push this even further where he can do sort of gradient descent type of algorithms in relational algebra and shows that that's a good reason to do so. So I, I rec strong, highly recommend reading his papers. Uh, you know, there's, there's work on documents and so forth. Perhaps that's not declarative query, but I'm not too interested in that because it's not too important for science. Arrays are, are outside this circle, but this IDB project is sort of attacking that and trying to expose that through languages. So some of this is being done. Okay, and then graphs, lots of people are working on graph languages. So what, what this talk is sort of about, or, one, or we, have, we have projects sort of covering various aspects of this space, but in this dark data and spreadsheets and sort of long tail messy data is where I want to uh, spend, spend some time uh, in the next few minutes. Okay, so our projects in this space to a first approximation are the following. So we have this database as a service, sort of for the 99%, for the long tail of science, if you will, uh, trying to make it easier to use to, uh, uh, trying to make these database features more accessible and, and, and uh, more widely used among scientists. And that's what I'm gonna spend most of the time on. We also have a, sort of for the 1%, if you will, the, the, a parallel data log system that we're working on for declarative scalable analytics. And uh, I'm not gonna talk about that, but I'm happy to talk about it offline. Then we're also working on uh, exploratory visual analytics, which is, a, which is connected to this database as a service system. And this is, you know, as soon as you allow people to sort of write queries, the first thing you want to do is, is create visualization, since we have kind of a declarative way and semi-automatic way of doing that. And then this last one I want to mention uh, that, again, I won't talk about is data pricing. And this is the, the lead PI here is Magda Belazinska. Uh, and the, the connection to science here is that if we can figure out how to price data in the cloud, we might be able to incentivize scientists to actually bother sharing it. And so I think that's a very promising approach that, that I, we can talk about offline. Okay. All right, so this is where I'm gonna focus the rest of the talk. Any questions so far? I sort of rattled through that. Okay. All right, so the problem we're looking at here is we went around and sort of talked to people and I asked this question, I'll ask probably people in the room uh, later, but we asked domain scientists, you know, how much time do you spend, quote, handling data as opposed to, quote, doing science? And we leave this uninterpreted. We let them interpret this however they, however they want. So what do you think the, the most common answer is? I'm gonna, huh? So that's, that's, a, that's a pretty good guess. So, so that's, that's what we get. So this was, this was, a, <laughs> this was sort of a jaw-dropping number to me, right? So this is, this is saying that, that Taxpayer money goes to NSF to come back to pay a biology postdoc to spend 90% of her time doing something that she doesn't consider science, right? 
This is, the, and again, this may be you can quibble about, well, sometimes data analysis is science, but, but we attempted to try to decouple these things, things that they don't consider science at all. Okay, so what are they doing in this time? Well, here's one example, and I'm sure many people in the room have other examples of what they spend their time doing. So these are two sort of ASCII files, uh, and each row in each one of these files represents a match. Uh, these, are, these are the results of a, of, a, of a run of a BLAST algorithm, right? So this was a query sequence, so in the life sciences, right? This is a query sequence of, of base pairs, and this is statistical, these, are, these columns, which many of you may be familiar with, describe the statistical information about the quality of the match. And this COG ID is the thing in the, in the public database that was matched, right? Does that make sense? Okay, so you run an algorithm over a bunch of query sequences and you get back a bunch of hits. This looks like this to this, to this degree of uh, 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 quality, and this looks like that. Similarly, this is, this is another uh, run of BLAST. So what they'll do is they'll take, you know, for example, where these came from, you'll take a cup of water from salty, uh, from a, a, a brackish, you know, estuary water where it's salty, and something else from fresh water, and you'll sequence it, and you'll do the BLAST, you'll uh, do a BLAST query, and you'll want to compare the results. Do you, are you trying to figure out the populations of the organisms in these two samples are similar or dissimilar, right? So the way she was doing this was to, you know, open up two spreadsheets. These aren't huge, right? These are sort of maybe uh, 10,000 records or something. So the size is not too much of an issue. You'll sort by COG ID, and then you'll kind of copy and sort both spreadsheets by, cop by uh, COG ID, and then copy and paste one into the other to try to line them up. So if people are, have some experience with databases, you might hear, what, what, what kind of algorithm is that? Or what, first of all, what kind of operation is that, I guess? So you're trying to find all the COG IDs in here that also match one in here. It's a join. Somebody says a join. So it's, and more specifically, it's kind of a sort merge algorithm, right? She sort of sorts the column, and then she brings them over and lines them up one by one and, and does it. So she's manually doing a join. So we, we threw both of these spreadsheets into a, into a database and wrote this query, and she was you know, sort of surprised. She said, well, that took me a week. And we said, well, what do you mean? She's like, literally, that took me a week to sort of manage all the, to uh, get the same answer that we had sort of done with, with a single query. So there's opportunity here. Uh, to, to, to bring this to them. So one, okay, so, so fine. So leave that as an anecdote. Uh, I, 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 I typically sort of bore people with several examples of this because you can do all kinds of nice things in, in SQL that people don't necessarily think of. For example, cleaning up your data. You don't have to have everything organized, but I'm not gonna show those examples. But I will show them sort of my favorite here. So another one that came up organically was, you know, find all tiger fam IDs, which are essentially just proteins, which you can think of as just objects, essentially that are missing from at least one of the three samples. All right, so you have three tables, and you're trying to find all the objects that are missing from at least one of them. So I'm gonna, so how do you, how do you write that in, say, SQL, or anything, really, for that matter, but let's say SQL for, for, for fun. Anybody have an idea? So it's a set-oriented language, right? So these are, this is sort of a set operation. Also, in a, in a, in a database-heavy crowd, you get a lot of suggestions about doing uh, fancy things with outer joins, but it's actually much, much, I claim, simpler than that. So it looks like this. This may look kind of complicated, but it's really not, right? This says union up the three sets together and then subtract their intersection, right? So take the union of everything and then get rid of all those things that are common to all three. So this is very, very natural to express, but this is something that's, you know, t t I claim 200 or 300 lines of, of Python code or R code to try to do the same kind of thing, right? And so this is what people are doing. They're either using spreadsheets in the case of this one example where they're not very, they don't have much programming background at all, or even if they do have programming background, they're writing these uh, long, hairy scripts. And so I think there's opportunity here to inject declarative query to reduce this 90%, the scary 90% number that, that, I, uh, that I showed. Okay. Now there's some questions here that I'm not gonna get too much into about, well, how do we train them to do it or how do we use it to offer a technology solution? And we have some ideas on that and that's part of the research problem. But if we can get over those humps, there seems to be opportunity. Okay. All right, so one other side comment. How many people are familiar with this idea of views, right? I assume most people, I hope, but maybe not. So many people are, uh, uh, so view, just think of it as a saved query. So with, with a view though, you can do lots of amazing things. You can integrate data from multiple sources you can, I claim you can standardize on units and apply naming conventions, right? You can sort of clean up your data. You just write more queries over your, over your ugly raw data, write clean views on top of it and, and expose those. You can attach metadata by adding new columns and adding new tables. 
You can do some data cleaning, as I mentioned. You can you know, filter out bad values, for example, if your sensor dropped out between this date and this date, just apply that filter and now you've exposed a, a, a cleaner data set to the rest of the world. You can maintain some version of provenance, although this is not to say that the views solve the entire provenance problem, but you do have this kind of hierarchy of views that get built up and you can query that and understand what depends on what. Uh, you can propagate updates, although that's a bit of a harder problem that's still not totally solved in the community, but there's tons of work on it. Uh, and then maybe you can even protect sensitive data, right? Because if you, assuming you can attach permissions to views, uh, this is a way of, of implementing some version of, of some notion of privacy. Okay, so if you just have queries and you just have views, I claim that there's, there's at least an attack on a lot of the problems related to scientific data management. Okay, so what's the point of all this? Well, databases are underused in the 99% is my, is my claim. And the conventional wisdom maybe says scientists, well, we'll they won't be able to write SQL. I, I don't really buy this as an argument, right? So we, we, our work has sort of shown that, that they can and they will. And further, you know, this was already shown pretty uh, tenably by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, right? So this is, you know, 5,000 papers were written, only 100 of which were written by the original PIs. The rest were written by people writing queries against a public database, right? So it's, so it's, it's pretty clear that they are indeed willing to write SQL. And in fact, you know, it, it, it's not an understatement to say that SDSS fundamentally changed astronomy, right? There's undergrads and graduate students that now program in SQL alongside IDL and Fortran and everything else, right? So it can happen. Okay, so, the, so, so the, that leaves the question though. If this isn't the reason, then why are these data, why, why is database technology underused in the 99%? Well, you no, know, it's for what I said earlier. We, we implicate difficulty in sort of installing these things, configuring them, uh, designing a schema, doing performance tuning, tuning loading the data. You know, you, you, the assumption is you have to build some sort of a GUI app around the database. You can't just write SQL uh, from, from scratch. So, you know, we, we instead want to ask how can we deliver just the parts of the data, just the features of the database we want which is a decorative query and maybe views in support of ad hoc Q&A. And so for that, we built, this, we built this system that I'm not gonna give you a demo, although it's available online at this URL, uh, where you can just upload data and you can query it and you can save views and you can share them with people and so on. And that's about it, all right? So we don't try to hide the SQL. So it's, it's very similar in spirit to Google Fusion Tables, by the way, if, you, uh, if you're familiar with that, although we were sort of kicking this around when Fusion Tables uh, came out, but they take a little bit of a different approach. They really do try to hide the SQL language behind a GUI, and we find that that limits the, abs limits the expressiveness too much. Okay. Uh, so let's see here. So you can upload a, a, a data file, and we make some effort to automatically infer types. Uh, we're trying to be very inclusive instead of exclusive, so we don't want to throw errors at this point saying, hey, your data's not clean enough. We really want to get it into the system at all costs and then let you clean it up with queries. And sometimes that doesn't work, but, all, but surprisingly, to us at least, it, it, it works more often than you might think. So for example, we can handle irregular numbers of columns in the file. We can handle, you know, you change the delimiter halfway down. You have columns with mixed types. You know, 99% 90, of them are integers, but then there's a little string value in there because someone typed something into a spreadsheet. We, we don't really mind all that. Okay, uh, and, and certainly there's tons more work to do here. There's some fantastic work by Kathleen Fisher, who, who pre previously was at AT&T on this LearnPad system where she can automatically infer the structure of ad hoc text file formats, and I'd love to try to apply that here. Um, and there's a similar, there's also ongoing work in the context of our NSF project around automatically extracting relational data from spreadsheets. Okay. Uh, so, right, so we automatically infer these things. We, we get a schema, you can check it and sort of see if it looks sensible. And then you have, a, you have a table. And what a table is in our world, we don't really have raw tables and views. We say everything's sort of a view. So there's a trivial view that's a, a, attached to every table. And then you can go in there and modify that. And in fact, frequently people do. A common workflow is to get the basic select star from, then immediately go in there and edit it to filter out some weird columns that came out or to remove null values or to do some other kind of cleaning. Okay. Uh, right, so once you have this basic model, you can imagine doing everything, you know, all the standard kind of what was once called Web 2.0 can be done here, right? Everything you can do with a YouTube video, you should be able to do with a, with a query. You should be able to share it, you should be able to rate it, you should be able to find what your friends are doing, you should be able to do more like this. And we don't necessarily have all those features because we're using very, uh, we're, we're sort of waiting for users to ask for them, but we have, we have some of them, right? You can, uh, um, well, I guess I sort of skipped this, but you can, and I, I won't describe that. You can edit the query versus derive a new query from it, and there's a slightly difference between those. Um, but right, you can look at your recent activity, you can look at what everyone else is doing, and so on. And you can imagine any, any number of features here if, if, if it's useful for people. Okay, so this is all built, I, I, I skipped that slide, or I took out that slide just for time, but this is all built on 
uh, uh, SQL Azure, Microsoft's database platform as the back end. But again, this is a sort of a layer on top of that that does a couple things. It changes the semantics of databases a little bit. It simplifies some tasks and complete, completely hides others. Uh, and it uh, adds new functionality, for example, the, the parsing of data and the sort of automatic type inference and things like that. And there's also query recommendation and so on. So it's sort of a layer on top of a database. Uh, but you can imagine applying it to any database. Okay, so just uh, before I wrap up, I'll just tell you some of the users that are working with this. I mentioned the example I gave before was from Robin Codner, who was a postdoc in a lab that we worked with and is now at Friday Harbor Labs, where she is involved in this program called the Sound Experience, where uh, they have kids sort of K through 12 all the way through undergrad uh, going out on these vessels for training in uh, seamanship, but she's trying to piggyback on that and actually get some science done as well, because they're going to be out there doing this Anyway, so she's uh, sort of taking vessels of opportunity, as they call them, uh, in order to get samples from areas that otherwise would be very expensive to do. So these, these research vessels cost on the order of $20,000 a day. So anytime you can sort of find a cheaper way to do that, it's, it's great. But the problem here is that what, what the data that comes out of this process is pretty ugly and messy. And so it's difficult to sort of build a tra traditional database. And so she's been enjoying using SQL Share. Uh, this is sort of her workflow. They'll do uh, mechanical separation oops, mechanical filtering methods uh, on the boat and sort of enter their data into spreadsheets live. And then they'll kind of come back to the lab and do nutrient analysis and toxin analysis and do some sequencing. And each one of these steps generates kind of tabular data uh, uh, in various formats that all needs to be sort of synthesized. And so having this kind of lightweight layer of, of, of synthesis has been pretty helpful. And in fact, she's gone on to, she has uh, workshops that she runs on teaching SQL to people using SQL Share. She's been uh, giving talks about SQL Share, like I'm not even asking her to do this. She just sort of runs around sort of advocating for us because she, she likes it so much. So it's been great. Uh, there's this nature mapping program with uh, Karen Dvornich where she's using m mobile devices to produce better range maps of species than can be done with a handful of graduate students, right? So these are these bio blitzes, if you've heard of this. This is sort of a citizen science project, right? So they'll get a bunch of people together on a weekend to go around and take pictures of birds and try to identify what they are, right? And so there's a whole back-end system that deals with this. But again, the, the, the heterogeneity and the quality of the data is somewhat suspect. So it's been resistant to a traditional kind of over-engineered database application. Okay. And so she's been enjoying this. Also, the, the fact that people need to, the same users who are collecting this, part of the incentive of participating in this program is that you get to play with your own data after the fact. And so she needed an interface to allow that kind of play and uh, uh, SQL Share provides part of that. Okay, uh, third example, just kind of got an email back from, from a, a user named Andrew White, who's in UW Chemistry, and he sort of talks about now, now we can accomplish a 10 minute, you know, a 100 line script that we used to run in 10 minutes in one line of SQL that takes a few seconds. And so what he does is sort of looks at these uh, uh, sort of phantom proteins that sort of mimic the behavior of, of, of drugs. And so they used to have a huge directory tree and plain text files and used to have to write all kinds of scripts and now they're added SQL to part of their toolbox, right? It's not to say that everything is in the database, but it, it adds it as a, as a uh, uh, tool in the toolbox. Okay. And so there's also computer science research questions here, of course. Once we get this basic workflow of, of upload, query, and share, uh, it, it opens up all kinds of other things. For example, SQL still might be hard to write for a novice, so can we simplify that? Well, you can imagine kind of a, a, a SQL autocomplete feature and other kinds of query recommendation, which is a, which is a reasonably hot topic in, in certain communities. We spent a little bit of time thinking about an English to SQL that, that's dried up a little bit because a, a student left. Uh, one thing I'm really interested in is, is automatically synthesizing an initial set of example queries from data with no other information. And the reason why this is important is that we find that if, if I can take some initial questions from the, uh, from the customer and write them in SQL and feed them back to them, that's enough to get them to start self-serving and bootstrap and kind of play with the SQL, right? They can tweak the, tweak the queries a little bit and open up the, the door. So the question is, you know, but that doesn't scale for me to do that for every, every, every user. So we're trying to figure out if we can automatically synthesize a good set of example queries. We claim that uh, people sort of self-train. Uh, and then there's the visualization, as I mentioned, and information extraction from spreadsheets. And so we're, we're thinking a little bit about privacy in, in these multi-tenant databases as well, because as we, as we start to do all sorts of inference, inferences on people's schemas, we want to try to reuse that information to help other users, but we don't want to accidentally expose private information in the process. So how much information is carried in the schema versus the data, for example? It's one of the questions we're looking at. 
Okay, so I, I guess I'll, that's, that's about it. I want to leave you with these maybe, maybe somewhat more controversial conjectures about declarative query in science. So I claim that most science data manipulation tasks can be expressed in relational algebra. All right. Without, without, well, I do have evidence, but I won't put evidence here on the slide. I also claim, a strong, maybe something stronger, is that most science analytics tasks can be expressed in relational algebra with some notion of recursion. Okay, and so this, again, is, is starting to be uh, explored by, by some folks. Uh, I also claim that once you've done so, once you've bothered to express this stuff in relational algebra-based languages, you can scale them up and you can run them thanks to, thanks to the cloud. Like, it's actually reasonable to do so. It's not just that you can, it's, it's not an academic exercise, it's actually productive. And then finally, I think that I, I claim that researchers are willing and able to program using these sort of declarative relational, relational algebra-based uh, languages. And so I'm, I was, my, my hope in sort of putting this into the last slide was that someone would raise their hand and yell and say how they disagree. So I'll leave it at that and open it up for questions. Yeah. So I, I guess I don't like the idea that dynamic programming is brought up as an example of a science task. That's an algorithmic method to achieve some actual science task. So I want to say that the science task that they actually want has nothing to do with dy dynamic programming, right? It has to do with some semantic thing that they want to do, and that can be expressed in relational algebra. Now, so the question you're getting at, though, is dynamic programming sort of absolutely required to get an efficient result for that task? Maybe. You know, do we have a good way of expressing you know, the best known algorithm for task X in relational algebra, maybe not, right? This comes up a lot in graph analytics, right? We can express graph analytics in data log, but it kind of stinks next, next to the best known algorithms in some cases. That, that's an issue, but I don't think, I don't, I don't think it's, like, like I guess I'm t what I'm tired of reading is bioinformatics papers, BMC, and B published in BMC bioinformatics that are eight pages long, and six of them describe a hybrid hash join algorithm that's available in every commercial database, right? And this is what happens, because people are spending a lot of time on bit twiddling and not on, the science. I see. I see. So may, if there's if there's strong links between the algorithm method and the science, uh, that would be interesting to explore as a, as a counterexample to this. Yeah. Question, okay. uh, and <clears throat> I'd like you to use the microphone because we're webcasting this. Thank you. Genoveva Vargas from CNRS in France. Um, I pretty agree with your points, but uh, you know we had some projects with astronomers and I do agree that you can use SQL for expressing things. I do agree that you can, some of the expressions are relational algebra-like expressions, but I have the feeling that anyway, scientists tend not to use DBMS. And this is because um, the whole workflow that you presented here, you know, data cleaning and then building your database uh, has kind of some pitfalls. First of all, we do not expose the way data are cleaned. And I think that for some uh, scientists, this process is very important because they have the feeling that they lose information, even if maybe they don't. But since this kind of process is hidden or is kind of dark, uh, then uh, people tend to use these separated tools, but with a little of reticence for, the, for really using them extremely, even if they agree that they uh, do not spare time in cleaning and doing these kind of things. Can you give a comment on sure, that? Sure, so my, my, I guess my reaction is I'm trying to open up that black box, and I think, I think we have some evidence that we've done so pretty well. So again, you know, take the dirty data in its rawest possible form and put that in the database. Now that, cha that, that requires changing how databases work a little bit, which is what we're trying to do. But if you can do that, now it's all there, right? So now as you, as you write queries to clean it up, to filter out bad values, now you've got a provenance trail of, what, of what's happened. It wasn't some graduate student who ran a Python script to clean up the data, then loaded that, where, that's, where the trail is lost and it's gone forever. It's now, you know, it, it, 
get the data into the database as early as possible and have it leave as late as possible. It's not always, you know, feasible to do that, but as much as you can, push that in. And we've seen, and we've seen that that's been a little bit easier than we first expected it uh, uh, to be. So, I, so again, I think, I think maybe this approach actually opens that up rather than closes it off. And, and, and in any case, that's certainly a big problem that we didn't cause, right? That's, that's a big problem in general, is that what were the steps that led up to this result and how do we inspect that? That's, that's a, that's a well, well, unsolved but well understood problem. Just curious, um, instead of using SQL, what about using like uh, .NET C Sharp with a link and Dryer link? Fantastic. That, I'm, I'm that way you got query language, absolutely. you got dynamic programming whatsoever? Absolutely, I'm a, I'm a huge fan of link. I think, I think if, if it wasn't for the friction related to sometimes switching over to Microsoft, that would be uh, what, I'd, <laughs> what I'd strongly recommend. I think it's fantastic. I'd like to see, and you're starting to see link-like things appear in other languages. Uh, and, and, and I love the trend. I mean, this, this is part of the observation here. I mean, I probably should have used that instead of talking about SQL as a bunch of strings that you have to pass to some database to interpret. You know, if you could actually have relational algebra right there in your programming language, uh, you'd probably use it, you'd see it used a lot more often. But right now, instead, we create these dictionaries and lists and so forth and process everything with that, and it's, and it's a mess. So I have a question. Bill, sure. right now, you're, you're going against a, a very uh, popular trend, or at least popular in the press, about the future of big data, which is it's all NoSQL yeah. now, and uh, therefore any mention of things like joins uh, should be banished from our, our our literature. Do you have any thoughts on on that? Uh, he scrolls down to some pictures we haven't seen. Uh, let me see if I, I was hoping I, I may not have it in here. Oh yeah, there it is. So I'll, I will I won't read it for reasons that will become clear, but. Oh, I can't. Well, I can't then. Uh, maybe I'll just show it offline. So my, my, my answer is, uh, so my, um, some people probably know this one. So, uh, well, okay, I'll read it. So, how, so, how do I, so, so there's two guys talking. One guy is, how do I query the database? And the other guy's you know, angry. He says, not, it's not a database. It's a key value store. Okay, it's not a database. How do I query it? Well, you write a distributed MapReduce function in Erlang. You know, and then so he says, did you just tell me to? <laughs> I, I, I believe I did, Bob. <laughs> So that, that's the joke. But anyway, that's, that's being glib. But really, I think, I think the, the, the more serious answer is, I think they, they latch themselves to this term, but they don't really mean no SQL. What they mean is no schema, right? What, what's, what was important, and, and that database people, frankly, myself included, you know, were less cognizant of, is that most of the data out there, it does not fit cleanly into some sort of well-structured thing. So what do you do with that? Well, we sort of throw up our hands and say, clean it up first, and then you can come into our walled garden. And things like Hadoop said, no, 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 we're gonna let you process it directly as it lies. That's a great idea. But that doesn't mean that declarative query languages are, are the problem, right? It's, it's schemas that are a problem. And that decoupling that I talked about in the beginning, that's what I think is critical. And I, and I don't think it's a magic trick either. I think it's pretty straightforward. You have rows and columns, then you can query them with SQL. That's, that's it. So and again, you're, sorry, let me blather. You, you are seeing this anyway, right? You saw Hadoop, and the, the first and the earliest and most successful projects in the Hadoop ecosystem were languages on top of it to sort of simplify things. And there's even more of these coming out, right? So, so that was. You know, it's, it's, I, I don't think it's, I don't think I'm the only one recognizing that, that higher levels of abstraction are kind of a good thing in this, in this space. Uh, another question. Uh, by the way, I'm sort of uh, stretching our time a little bit since we've got two hours for lunch and we want to have as much discussion as possible. So, um, how do I compute a covariance matrix in, in, uh, SQL or SQL plus. Take a look at Joe, Hel at, at Joe Hellerstein's Mad Lib library, or the or the the, uh, the uh, Mad Skills paper. I'm not sure it'll have exactly that example, but but he shows how to do some matrix computations in SQL, and also shows that they're it's reasonable to do so under some circumstances. In some circumstances, it's really slow, but in other, in some cases, it scales really well, and so on. So it's, it's not it's not an obviously bad idea to start thinking about things that way. The other thing, nice thing you can do is you can, once you do express it that way, it seems kind of colossally weird, right? We spend all this time optimizing matrix calculations. Why, why would you bother doing this relational algebra way? Because you can optimize it, right? You have this, you can do algebraic optimization now. You understand what exactly is being done. So, you, for example, you can just push selects through the, through the expression. You can't really do that with LinPack, for example. But it remains to be seen in a case-by-case -case basis. Again, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying that it's solved. 
Okay, anything else? All right, let's thank Bill again. So uh, our next speaker is uh, Professor Jeffrey Fox from Indiana University. He's actually a distinguished professor and a member of the School of Informatics, the Department of Physics, the Department of Computer Science within the School of Informatics and Computing. Uh, he is uh, well known in the high performance computing community. He was the guy that uh, first started saying if you distribute computing along around a bunch of, at that time, called microprocessors uh, and configure them into a cosmic cube that you could do great things. Uh, he has been active uh, in so many branches of science. I'm not even going to try to mention he's an old collaborator with Tony Hay as well and as well with me and actually uh, he's going to talk about something we've been thinking about together. So thank you for the opportunity to talk. I'm going to give a rather high level uh, presentation on work uh, I did with Dennis stemming originally from a request from um, the National Science Foundation to understand whether clouds, how clouds should be used to support science. Um, so I, I, I'm going to discuss um, how clouds can be used and compare it with how we uh, do science um, already at, at today. And if you look at the way science is done today, here's at least um, one possible classification. We obviously have a lot of so-called supercomputers. And uh, those are multi-core nodes with very high performance um, networks. And now uh, most, most many of those now have GPU enhancements to get higher performance. And the dominant use of those is probably highly parallel simulations. And um, the next, there is another important class of uh, facility typified by uh, the Open Science Grid or the European Grid Initiative, which is usually called high throughput computing. And the most uh, obvious, I mean, a very clear success of that is the analysis of the data from the Large Hadron Collider, which is, which is analyzed across the globe with such systems. Those uh, systems sort of came from the grid activity, which focused on federating resources. And grid research and grid work over the last 10 years had two important contributions to environments, namely portals, which allow you to access some computers, and workflow that allows you to integrate multiple processes into a single job. As well as those broad classes, science, um, if you look at, say, Exceed, the major NSF facility, it also has specialized uh, visualization systems and specialized uh, machines such as shared memory machines for problems which don't paralyze on distributed memory. Um, so if you look at uh, high performance computing, those machines, I just, just, those environments I just discussed, you could view as high performance computing machines or systems. But we can also look at the problems that they run and ask uh, and se separately and um, the, there's one, so I think, one relatively clear statement. If you really want to run 100,000 cores on parallel uh, particle dynamics, uh, then it's probably best to use the supercomputer. There's not much point in using an elastic cloud, and you'll get terrible performance, probably. So, but uh, clouds can be used, as we'll see, for many of the problems, and the very, various advantages of clouds are listed here. These are quite standard. Um, the elastic advantage is uh, obviously important for real-time work. There is um, not obvious, the, the economy isn't quite so clear because by definition every machine in the NSF network runs at 100% of utilization. And if you're running at 100% utilization, um, it's hard to compete with that uh, uh, for um, cost. Um, you do get pretty lousy turnaround at times, but uh, the cost is fine. Um, clouds uh, have important software models, uh, such as MapReduce and um, other uh, platform as a service features. An interesting feature of clouds for universities is the number of jobs in supercomputing is not so large. 
Uh, a recent report sponsored by Microsoft says there are going to be 14 million jobs by 2015. And so this means that um, doing research on clouds and teaching about clouds has great interest to students, whereas it's not, not necessarily so interesting to students uh, for supercomputing. Um, So some uh, relatively obvious remarks about comparing clouds and grids and high-performance computing. Grids are distributed. That has the highest synchronization costs. HPC systems or supercomputers run in Finiband networks and have very low latency and very high bandwidth. And clouds almost sort of lie in between. They don't necess they're not necessarily as distributed as grids. But they will also have overheads from virtualization, which means their latencies will not be as good. So that means almost trivially, clouds can run anything that grids can run, because they have better, better uh, synchronization. But they will not necessarily run things that supercomputers can run. Um, so there are some, if we look at the, the way grids, what grids develop, grids emphasize the importance of services and the importance of workflow. As far as I can see, those concepts work equally well on clouds and grids, and in fact, potentially supercomputers, though they tend not to be used so much on supercomputers. So if we look at what, what we have now and what can expect in the future, um, we certainly need supercomputers to do the 100,000 core simulations. There's not much point in trying to discuss moving them. Um, grids are going to be important because the data is bound to be distributed. And uh, we also want to integrate access to machines across the world, or in the case of the US, across the US. You want to go to Texas, Illinois, or wherever your favorite supercomputer is. Um, we are, do have high throughput computing. High throughput computing, as far as I can see, is clearly either doable through clouds or through the ways the Open Science Grid or EGI does it. There, the um, issue is one of economy, also the fact that LHC is not going to switch to using all clouds for all their work because they have it fully operational on, on OSG and EGI, so they certainly they need to discover the Higgs as quickly as possible, so they shouldn't switch. Um, for clouds, I wanted to, I will make a, a little remark later on about the difference between public clouds and private clouds. So we'll call Google, Amazon, and um, Azure uh, public clouds. Now, if one problem with private clouds is they're not very big. What science clouds exist are pretty small. So things like elasticity are not quite so striking. It's not so obvious that it works if you only have a small system. In any case, I think let's imagine a world about which has these four, these four features, cloud, high throughput, grids, and supercomputers. So you ask which applications work on clouds. <coughs> so it's relatively obvious what is called pleasingly parallel works well on clouds because they don't have synchronization problems. And I believe that, and those, of course, are precisely the ones that work well on um, high throughput um, systems. That clearly <coughs> describes what is often called the long tail of science, the fact that you get parallelism not from taking a single job and putting it on 100,000 cores. You take 100,000 biologists, each doing sequencing and analyze their results on, independently on a, a back-end cloud. Um, we've already pointed out that anything run through science gateways or portals or workflow is going to run well on clouds, because workflow is um, tends to be integrating loosely multiple processes, so the synchronization costs of clouds is unimportant. Now, it's not quite so trivial in, in some of the, when you come to data analytics, because um, obviously MapReduce is, is an, very famous for this field, and if we went to it, at least when I was at SC11, an enormous amount of the buzz was how MapReduce and Hadoop was dominating commercial data analytics. Um, uh, but uh, there are some problems there, at least for some cases, which uh, say Bill Howe and, I, and I, other people, uh, group, groups we have at Indiana, have been looking at iterative version of MapReduce because we all, if we look at uh, 
any parallel linear algebra, that is not going to run well on map bridges because it is not the simplest map bridges. So <coughs> if we look and try to see if these principles are illustrated by actually what's happening today, uh, there are obviously talks today and tomorrow. There's Venus C, the Azure project in Europe, which has got a lot of several successful application. The Ocean Observatory and Although particle physics is not analyzed in, product, in huge numbers on clouds, the people who are using clouds, I think, find it successful. I can mention the project I'm involved with, Future Grid. I have some slides on that, but one interesting feature of its use is that, which is a cloud environment, half the, over half the applications are from life science. Whereas if you look at the rest of Exceed, that's a much smaller fraction. And the reason is twofold. One is life science is pretty good for clouds. Perhaps more importantly, it's just that life science is building a whole set of new applications. If you're starting from scratch, it makes sense to target a cloud, whereas if you have your job running already on OSG or, or um, your favorite supercomputer, you're not so likely to switch. Um, another interesting comment, we look locally in the life science area. The Lilly Corporation, which is one of the, probably the most successful company in Indiana, it is using clouds to do the type of problems similar to what Joe described, um, um, doing cloud bursting. So when they run out of time on their local clusters, they do their chemical chemistry computations for drug discovery on, on a cloud. However, if you look at the biologists at Indiana, none, as far as I know, none of them are using clouds. Um, so here, Future Grid, uh, all I want to say about that is it's a rather small system. It's an illustration of how science clouds are not very big. We just have 4,500 cores split between five clusters. And its main, and uh, it was designed to be small because it's mainly for experimentation, not for production. And here's some interesting statistics about how it's used. It has 200 projects. and. 15% of those projects are life science, 14% are other applications, but 35% are computer scientists. That says that clouds are obviously of great interest to computer scientists and have not made the um, um, step towards large-scale application use yet. The other major area of use of Future Grid is education. It says 9%, it's probably actually more than that because although the use is 9% counting projects, but each of those projects has lots of users and so it has a pretty large impact on future grid. The type of environment the clouds offer of on-demand is clearly more suitable for education than, say, the classic supercomputer where you have to wait. And we had complaints from some colleges using um, Exceed for um, education. They waited two days for their students to run their jobs. Um, if you look at the actual technologies, the top technologies are Nimbus and Eucalyptus, which are basic infrastructure as a service applications. Uh, we run HPC as well. You can do either on uh, Future Grid. And then after that, we have Hadoop and MapReduce. So we have, so the dominant applications on Future Grid are what you'd expect, infrastructure as a service, followed by platform as a service with MapReduce. And you can go online and look at all these 200 projects. So let's just go into a little more detail on um, cloud applications. So the, these pleasingly parallel, this is, parallel, is sort of, you can look at in two types of ways. One is parallelism over users. That's lots of scientists on the long tail. The other is parallelism over usages. That could be uh, a single um, uh, Lilly uh, chemist running millions of chemistry simulations independently on the cloud. So that's a Sort of, they look to the same roughly to the cloud, but they have somewhat difference, some difference. And um, <coughs> if you want to look at MapReduce for this type of problem, that is sort of the map-only version of MapReduce, where you just have lots of independent uh, jobs running. One important and obvious example of, uh, of um, cloud is the Internet of Things. That's the fact there's meant to be all these devices, 50 billion it says here. And each of those devices needs some sort of back-end services either to coordinate themselves or to um, access and get information. 
And um, obviously, a cloud has huge um, attraction for enabling the Internet of Things. And of course, one aspect of the Internet of Things is environment is lots of sensors of scientific value, environmental sensors, and things like that. And so, one I expect a very important growing use of clouds will be for scientific uh, applications, the Internet of Things. Uh, let me think. I have a picture here. Uh, so I have some work with uh, Kansas University analyzing sensors from uh, taking data at the North Pole, either sensors flown in an aircraft or towed on the ice sheets. And those can be analyzed. They are analyzed actually using MATLAB on the cloud. And then they produce outputs, which then tell you why, uh, why the glaciers are melting. Another interesting example on the top uh, left is robots. Here's a Lego robot. And it appears that uh, controlling robots is a pretty interesting cloud application, as long as you don't have too much delay getting to your cloud and back. So maybe that's going to be a local or private cloud. And of course, in the middle at the top is the dominant consumer operation where your cell phones are clearly controlled successfully by a cloud. So the other, um, we already pointed out that uh, portals and workflow are very um, satisfactory cloud activities. Portals themselves, sort of, I guess in Azure, they're, a, they're just a role, a web role. But um, portals tend to be used by many, by a community to, act, to actually generate lots of small jobs. And so portals actually not only can be put on the cloud as the portal interface, but then can run the job on the cloud. I've already pointed out why workflow is a good idea on the cloud, because there are not tight synchronization constraints for workflow. And you tend to be just integrating multiple processes. Now we come to classical parallel computing. Um, so I already noted that I don't think we're going to be running. A, if we look at the classic parallel computer running MPI, that's going to still run MPI. And we will, and they, people will take these machines to exascale, and hopefully they will make great discoveries and build a new battery and and design new materials and things like that. Um, but you're not going to use MapReduce to do that because those. Those are, are all iterative algorithms. You have to march the solution forward in time. And you cannot afford the synchronization cost uh, present in MapReduce. Um, however, as, as if you now look at data analysis, data analysis is, is um, a little different from, uh, from HPC. It is not lots of small messages linking neighboring grid points together. It's typically large messages which you need to do your parallel linear algebra. And that's been shown to work reasonably well on iterative map produce. And if we compare that type of application with the commercial web 2.0, which obviously use, which can use map produce. And those are actually larger usages than supercomputers, the bigger systems. Um, and they are sometimes intrinsically parallel. When you search the web, you're searching that web in parallel. and they have also got lots of users running in parallel. So they have both types, the user, uh, multiple users and multiple usages. I note as a, a side remark that although MapReduce runs well on the internet search, if you were just doing page rank, you wouldn't find MapReduce very well because MapReduce is basically a page rank is basically a piece of linear algebra to find the uh, largest eigenvalue, an eigenvector. But in any case, this type of application, even if does not need microsecond messaging latency. And so uh, it can run well on more commodity hardware. So here I have a graph I often show, but there's not, not probably not time. We show you these four classes of uh, messaging. Map only, that's pleasingly parallel. Basic map reduce, which is a map followed by reduction. Iterative map reduce, which is map reduction, iterated. And then on the Loose, so-called loosely synchronous. That's your classic MPI with lots of small messages. And there are applications falling in those four classes. For map only, you can just do it with, uh, say, in Azure, with worker roles. You don't actually need to use MapReduce, but you can, in some cases, usefully use MapReduce when you want to coordinate those pleasingly parallel applications. Uh, let me just. 
I'll skip these. So if you look at iterative applications, this shows you how they look in, uh, in, um, in um, iterative map reduce. You do your compute and you reduce. You, t you, can s you can improve performance by just caching the data, uh, keeping it in, in memory, uh, all the data that is, does not change from iteration to iteration. If you look at all those uh, HPC applications, most of the data does not change. This amount of information communicated between nodes from iteration to iteration is a, a small fraction of that which is used within the nodes. In fact, that's precisely why those applications are efficient. They do not communicate much information. And Hadoop and MapReduce does not build in that critical fact of many applications. Which fact is true for all in parallel linear algebra? Here's a nice example which uh, Judy might discuss tomorrow. Here we're doing um, k-means clustering. And um, this is just showing you uh, typically running on Azure. And if you just look at the uh, t top um, left, you just see the, flat, the execution time of these tasks. If I was running an HPC application, I would expect every task to take the same time to within less than 1% because that's how I get good performance. Here on Azure, we're getting fluctuations from t over the task in a given iteration. The red is one iteration, the blue is the next iteration, and there are possibly 5% fluctuations. So that's sort of acceptable. You're still going to get good speed up with 5% fluctuations. If you try to take this from uh, 256 cores up to um, 100,000 cores, these fluctuations will probably kill you but it's okay at this modest size. So this suggests that the modest size clouds have acceptable performance to do some applications. You see on the top right, another is already showing it's okay. You just have the amount of work done as a function of time, and you see a little gaps. That's when the communication is happening, and those gaps are not taking much of the time. It's again a few percent. So this says that this obeys the classic rules of ordinary parallel computing. We have tasks taking roughly the same time, interspersed with communication, which takes a small fraction of the total time. So this basically summarizes the usage modes of clouds. Um, we have MapReduce type, pleasingly parallel over user, pleasingly parallel over usages, iterative parallel algorithms with large messages. That's the one I just went to you, showed you, and then we did workflow and portals. And then, we can discuss what we need to use to do um, um, to implement clouds, and we have these various features. Uh, we have interesting file systems, queues, tables, MapReduce, services for everything, portals, appliances, and roles, and then environments such as Memcached or Google App Engine, and of course, Workflow. If you compare that with um, grids and supercomputers. Grids and supercomputers told us to use uh, MPI, various multi-threaded libraries. Grids told us to use services and portals and workflow. <coughs> HPC told us to build libraries. They said, if you look at the result of the, what we did over many years for HPC, we produced wonderful libraries like Petsy, which enabled our Linpack, or Scalar Pack, which enabled us to build into, into applications that get good performance. And we did also parallel IO and wide area file system. And I find a quite interesting contrast between what clouds offer the user and what HPC offer the user. They're not in contradiction, but they're sort of different. And it might be useful to try to unify these, build great libraries for clouds, and put um, SQL as a service on HPC systems and things like that. So somebody challenged me, um, Marty, I think, the, whether platform as a service was a good idea. And the, uh, Dennis said that Microsoft was reconsidering it or something. Um, so it's, or at least moving to offer infrastructure as a service as well. So if you have your existing code, these nifty platforms may not be terribly useful. Uh, but I guess I think it, our experience since when we built Twister for Azure, we were able to use Azure tables, queues, and the storage models with higher, and be able to produce that code much simpler than we would have done if we had to write everything from scratch. 
And um, so I think one of the most exciting features of clouds is, in fact, the high-level tools that they're producing. And whereas gl grids were rather fixated on federating, which is a rather mythical concept to me, uh, and clouds are actually with map produce and iterative map produce and tables and queues struck me as pretty exciting. And um, so I have here the summary of what we built over the last uh, 20 years. And I'm hoping the next 10 years can go back to what we did in, from 1990 to 2000, which is build things that actually help the user directly rather than uh, re um, rather more uh, different issues. So how much time do I have, Dennis? Well, let me just skip over these slides. This is just uh, how to use cloud, some lessons, uh, especially from the work that uh, from people who have been using Azure. Dennis uh, uh, did most uh, effectively compile these lessons. Uh, the lessons are you build the things that applications as a service, uh, and that's at least consistent with what Grids taught us. You try to use what already exists, but obviously you use Hadoop or you use um, uh, SQL as a service and things like that, or existing images. Uh, here, this statement which I believe in, which may be, which you should try to use platform as a service if you can. An important comment here is failure. Um, most HPC systems is, uh, uh, put a lot of money into never failing, and uh, clouds have uh, built somewhat on the principle that you can get much better scalability if you allow failure. And you need to build your application to, so, to respect that. And we, here we have use as a service uh, where possible. And the final comment is <coughs> you need to persuade Internet 2 and others to make certain that you can move your data to the cloud or between clouds. Here's some comments on private clouds. And one of the problems with private clouds, they don't really exist as far as I know. There are no very large private cloud installations. And also, there's not very good software for private clouds. Most of the work uh, is still sort of at the basic infrastructure as a service level. Um, and even that work is still, only is still changing pretty rapidly. And although they're tools like Hadoop and HBase, Cassandra and Zookeeper, they're not so easy to integrate and use. They're not properly packaged like they are on Azure and Amazon. And so here's an illustration. Like Eucalyptus just came up with Eucalyptus 3. That's the blue. Here we're plotting the time it takes to deploy images on FutureGrid. And the red curve was Eucalyptus 2, which we had to use until about a month ago. And it basically, we could only deploy 16 nodes at a time, and it took quite a long, it took uh, 200 seconds per image, as OpenStack and was much better. And Eucalyptus 3, which is the new commercial version, is now better performance Eucalyptus 2. But I just want to point out this only happened over the last month. So this, not, this points out this field is still pretty immature, and we need, I think, to put more effort into building private clouds. The software is just not not um, really up to scratch to, to allow you to deploy a large-scale science cloud. And here we're just discussing infrastructure as a service. And uh, this one also has Open Nebula on it. Um, so I just finished with some research challenges. So here's some, uh, this is work I did with Manish Parashar as a result of this NSF effort to try to uh, see what was um, good for what clouds were good for. Obviously, we want to design algorithms which really exploit cloud features. We need to do more work on performance, <coughs> both understanding it and what applications have good performance. We need to improve the performance of clouds. There are lots of important security issues. There's work needed in standards. And um, I think we really need to put a huge effort into making MapReduce as a viable uh, technology which inputs all the, all the data types that science wants and, uh, and um, can do these things like iteration. Um, I have a pet peeve about the storage model. Um, again, if you look at HPC, it uses Lustre, it's not, uh, whereas uh, commercial clouds use object stores, and somewhere between lies the Hadoop file system, which is 
doesn't seem to be used by anybody except the dupe. And I'm a little confused there. So I think there's lots of research needed there. If we're going to build a viable side science cloud, we may have to federate multiple, multiple different places, but hide that federation from users, not expose it like we did with grids. And uh, I think we need, as I pointed out, the platform as service is pretty, pretty crude at the moment. Academically, we need to take these tools and integrate them. And by the way, we have to train 14 million people. So that means at least we'll get plenty of students at our classes if we have this research activity to get them involved in their projects. So I'm going to I'll stop there and uh, open up for questions. I have two questions. First of all, you had this um, slide where you showed the usage of various systems. And you distinguished between MapReduce and Hadoop. And I'm sort of wondering why you did that. Oh, that's but I have a, a second triviality. question, which, well. Uh, we, this came from the form that the users fill in when they use FutureGrid. And they can select either MapReduce or Hadoop. Yeah, well, OK. So most of the users, of course, on FutureGrid who use MapReduce use Hadoop, but not all of them do. Um, OK, but the, the real question I have, you, you asserted that linear algebra is not well suited to map reduce, and I know that the previous speaker uh, said just the opposite, and in fact pointed to the Berkeley Joe Hellerstein's work. Um, and I'm, I'm especially puzzled by your remark that PageRank doesn't run well on uh, on map reduce, given that map reduce was designed to implement PageRank. Yeah, well, I do not. Uh, this, this, the performance of matrix algebra and, and the optimal parallel matrix algorithms are very well understood. And it is quite clear that they are they're iterative algorithms, which run better on iterative map produced than non-iterative map produced. Page rank, the actual core algorithms are a small part of the running of an internet search engine. And I'm sure, and you can certainly implement it on map produced, but again, it's much more efficient on iterative map produced, runs about 10 times faster than the dupe on page rank. I don't think anybody was ever saying that, uh, no one was ever saying you don't iterate MapReduce to do page rank. You obviously have to. It's an iterative algorithm. If you look at the standard, if you look at the standard performance model for parallel algorithms, the overhead is a communicate, goes like a communication time over a, over a computation time. If you look at MPI or at some iterative MapReduce, that communication time has latencies of multiple microseconds, and it has the ba full bandwidth of the, of the internet. If you take the simplest versions of a dupe, the um, communication time corresponds to writing the data to disk and reading it back from disk, which is obviously much longer. And you can measure it, and it is clearly much slower. It has huge advantages writing the disk because you get much better fault tolerance and insensitivity to uh, load imbalance and things like that, but it has a cost in performance. I, 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 you may be thinking sort of as a numerical analyst, uh, no, I'm thinking but as a real the, the, the Google guys, they, they, just, they just want to get it done cheaply. They're not so worried about whether it takes microseconds or milliseconds. Uh, they're, they're, they're just trying to bring very large numbers of machines, to, uh, cheap machines, to bear to get done what they need but to they, do. If you take a serious clustering algorithm or as I said, I don't think page rank is a significant part of the execution time, so it doesn't matter. But if you take a large scale clustering algorithm or something like that, you will find it runs very poorly on ordinary on a dupe. I have many papers which have shown that. Nobody has challenged it. And we've measured it in great detail. Uh, this is uh, YDU. Uh, you know, I noticed uh, you have uh, fault tolerance, high availability, energy efficient as a green clouds. But uh, I haven't heard you talk about the, uh, you know, very important issues, which is in the security area. I was wondering whether you can cover I some. said many, I apologize. But, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a little bit detail in terms of I the security. I did not mean to downplay it by only putting one bullet there. 
Dennis was glaring at me, so I thought I should stop. Security is very important, and there are lots of very important security issues. There's a recent NSF workshop, maybe you were at that, which identified those security issues. And I have some slide late in a different slide deck, which has a page at least from that workshop of the security issues. I'm not, I consider cloud security a very important area. One more question, yes. Um, so in your slides, you mentioned about uh, uh, distinguish between the HPC machines and the HPC problems. I think this is very uh, interesting, especially um, you mentioned a lot of different infrastructures to uh, support different uh, features of the applications. So I want to know if there is a, a well accepted uh, uh, categories for the HPC problems so that part of them can be handled by uh, well, I think if you something. look at the usage of large-scale NSF supercomputers, that's what I meant by HPC problems. And I think that's well, pretty well understood. And they are large-scale particle simulations, solution of ordinary or ODEs or PDEs. They are, there is also, a, from the grid activities, these things I mentioned about open science grid. And in the case of... And there are also, for data analysis, there's clearly a lot of work on uh, parallel linear algebra, which, which I would consider a classic. Obviously, Jack, Jack Dungara and his many other people in the, in the field have done a lot of work on uh, parallel linear algebra. And so those, those sort of came out of the work from 1990 to 2000, have been extended over the last 10 years. Those I call the HPC problems. Where I say internet search, came out of a different community, so I didn't call it HPC. So page rank and map reduce and that question, and I, I think one thing to think about there is that the way I view this is that you have an architectural issue. That if you think about the architecture that you have available, for example, a large data center with its typically weak interconnect, that it, that a map reduce implementation may in fact be the best algorithmic implementation, or at least an iterative map reduce for that architecture. Whereas if you had a different machine, something with a really rich interconnect, you would use more traditional linear algebra thing. Would, it, would you agree with that? I'm a huge fan of MapReduce and iterative MapReduce. <laughs> I'm just trying to, I mean, on different audience, I get attacked from a different side. Okay. Right? <laughs> as long as I'm attacked everywhere by everybody, probably I'm roughly, that's okay. Um, I think MapReduce will, should, the, if I, cri I criticize, or may I, I actually try to criticize here the traditional um, NSF supercomputer initiatives and the activities for ignoring things. MapReduce does not run on Exceed except on FutureGrid. And I think the fact that that's those newer technologies, HDFS, MapReduce, those are completely ignored on um, national facilities is a great shame and, and does, it's, not a, it's not a good idea. Okay, well, thank you, Jeffrey. Thank you. So, so our last talk uh, before lunch is one uh, that I'm actually quite fond of. It's a, some work that's been done on polygonal GIS data, and it's from uh, Sushil Prasad from Georgia State University and his team. Uh, I happen to know that they have used a fairly large number of Azure cycles on this work, so uh, I'm glad to see a paper. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm going to talk about uh, something that actually we have implemented 
Um, so, so it's going to be a slightly lower level um, in terms of you know the implementation details um, as opposed to the other talks. And we actually have a HPC application uh, implemented for a real domain, GIS domain, geographic information systems domain. So I'm going to relate to you actually what we have done. Um, uh, it's surprising that we didn't find a nice implementation of how to do uh, what is called overlay operation uh, for uh, you know these geoscientists that and this this operation that they do typically they take multiple layers and they overlay on top of each other for a variety of reasons. For example, if hurricane is coming, you want to find out what are the you know safe shelter areas and so on. Uh, the state of art happens to be sequential desktop processing, and they take hours and, and sometimes days. Uh, trying to do these operations. So this was actually the problem that we took up, uh, partly because of um, research challenges and also actually because of the funding from Microsoft as well as NSF. They jointly came together. So we realized this is actually an important area to really look at. And, and we actually have um, uh, three PhD students working in this area now uh, uh, doing a variety of things. So I'll tell you actually what the GS data uh, and computation looks like. Um, what is the nature of this computation? It is not actually the embarrassingly parallel application. Uh, it does actually take, um, so it, it's irregular. Uh, it's not also, you know, something that, you know, typically the MPI applications look like. And so we encountered a lot of um, problems in the beginning, even to get up to speed. Uh, but I think um, with what we have done so far in the last uh, year, year and a half, uh, we have good templates for the community use as well. So um, um, the GIS data is typically of two kinds. Uh, raster data, which is more of the pixelated data, and the vector data, they call it vector. The, what they actually mean is, is they have lines, points, polygons, uh, where, where you can actually put a lot of meta information. So, so as you overlay these things, let's say hurricane source with you know, let's say the city plan, you can actually get uh, much higher um, value data than, than you can actually do the querying on top of it. And so uh, they have these many layers of the same area describing different things. Uh, for example, you know, the postal code, the sensor tracks, transportation network, and so on. Um, and then one of the applications that I mentioned, of course, was the emergency response, and then, you know, and which would be actually the real-time application. Um, you also have things like city planning, habitat analysis, and I think somebody referred to um, how to look at the wildlife. In this case, uh, they actually look at the wolves uh, fitted with sensors and see how they change their habitat based on the density. Uh, so, so there are actually a variety of applications ranging from real-time applications to um, um, planning policy kind of applications to environmental applications. So, so it's a very rich area uh, in terms of uh, why we should be doing this. Uh, file sizes actually are huge, uh, ranging from you know, megabytes to terabytes. Um, some of the things that we have been looking at actually are in the early range, which I would call a mid-range. Um, you know, a little bit less than a, a gigabyte. Uh, but then these actually keep growing. Um, so, so the nature of computation actually happens to be, of course, you have data intensive um, part, uh, and then um, you have huge files, and that happens to be one of the key problem, which we um, found. And of course, you know, the irreg irregular nature of the computation. Um, so, so when you take polygons and you want to intersect, they potentially actually are all over, and it's not, um, easy to identify what really you have to do, what the tasks are. So, so that there's a uh, lot of uh, task identification problem. Uh, you can do after this, you can do coarse grain parallelism, and better actually you would like to do fine grain parallelism, and then that's actually part of the research questions. I'll, I'll also, what I will do actually is to point out what are the open problems right now. What we've achieved is um, uh, using a fairly small number of cores, for example, 100 cores, we have 30 times speed up, 40 times speed up, depending on the data. Uh, that we are looking at. If things are skewed in terms of you know, the application not being very uh, nicely uniformly grained, um, it could be as low as 10 times. Um, but the good thing is that this, is, this seems to scale very well to um, uh, the small scale that we have used so far. So in this case, we have used 100 Azure workers and getting um, a decent 30 times speed up. This is end-to-end -end speed up uh, from, from the file to file. Uh, <coughs> Which is actually impressive, you know. This kind of efficiency actually we can maintain, uh, and and what what experiments actually are pointing out is that we are able to maintain this over a new, uh, fairly uniform load, and then this should scale well, which we are going to be testing. Um, the problems really what we identified problem was 
uh, not necessarily there, how well we can scale for the good data that we have. Um, but what are the other problems really that community might have been facing and why there is no system which is even a parallel system right now. And, and that has to do with uh, various things which I will point out, but file IO is, is one of the key thing. Um, there is no nice parallel algorithm for such um, problems at hand, although computational geometry community has been doing a variety of things in terms of uh, line dissection and so on, but, but in terms of polygon overlay and so on, uh, there is no nice um, algorithm for multi-core. We would actually also like to do this on GPUs. There are these data structures that typically these communities use as to how to organize uh, information. Uh, so, so there are variations of quad tree called R tree and, and such, which of course are, these are the research problems that we are actually looking at and I think community can take up. Um, so why cloud, why Azure especially? I think uh, Azure primarily was because of the funding. Uh, frankly, uh, and, and uh, also actually we saw in Azure an opportunity to do something which is uh, an evolving platform. It was frankly quite difficult to really get up to speed, and then APIs kept changing, and there are a variety of issues that I will also mention. It, it actually does lack uh, things like what we in the parallel programming community um, pretty much take it for granted, you know, MPI and things like that. And so, so this, this actually was kind of a real discovery for us, how to really go about programming. Uh, HPC application on this. Okay. Um, we do like, of course, you know, the inbuilt uh, resilience of, of storage and such. So um, let me tell you about what we have done. Um, this community, I think, is very familiar with the Azure platform, but let me restate. Uh, you have two kinds of workers um, or the processes. You have the web process, which actually will interface with the user where the GIS scientists, for example, can talk about which layers and what files they, um, they are going to be working on. And then once you take that, you, you identify tasks, which I will tell you how, then you farm it off to the workers. So there are you know, basically these two kinds of uh, processors. And you can use um, a variety of storage mechanism that's available. Uh, queue for um, communication, which we have used very effectively. You also have various storage um, blob and, and tables such, and we have dabbled with both found uh, Blob to be the, uh, our solution and not table, which is more organized. We would have loved to use table, but we couldn't for, for um, this capacity problem. I'll also show you how we have actually leveraged of state of art techniques. So we have not invented everything. There was no reason to. So, so for example, GIS community is using certain code to do their operations, operations in terms of intersecting layers, unioning, and so on. And so we have uh, taken those. And in fact, this also allows us to kind of go, go into other libraries which are available. Um, these are actually all sequential codes. So, so it nicely um, goes and, and does sequential tasks if we can identify and lots of them, which is what we have done. But they're not actually multi-threaded. And that's one of the things that we are working on. Um, so the platform that we have created for this GIS overlay application, um, we have looked at a variety of load balancing techniques, which, which is what we computer scientists actually love to do. And we found that these techniques actually scale very well. Uh, once you identify tasks, and if they're independent, you are able to actually farm it out. And so I'll talk about some of these uh, load balancing techniques as well. So um, centralized architecture, where the web role takes the files and uh, parses it finds out which polygon intersects what. So in fact, in this picture I'm showing you, uh, the red and the green, uh, there are these two layers which are being intersected. Uh, one, one layer is called the base layer. Base layer meaning you actually have to use the metadata for that layer to produce the output. Uh, and then overlay layer that you're um, putting together. So, so as you can see, for example, B1 is a base layer that you know polygon which is going to intersect with O2 and O3. So you have to identify these and that becomes a task. Once you've done this identification, then of course that is a task that can be farmed out to um, a worker, a dual worker. And so uh, depending on how many base layer polygons are, if you have found out these intersections, which we call intersection graphs, you are able to partition and then, then you launch. Uh, but so this is actually being done by the web role. It looks at the file, parses and finds these tasks. Uh, sorting and other things are involved. You can also use R3 here right now. Um, we are not using it. Um, and then um, you, you launch these tasks onto the Azure workers. There is a demand and supply imbalance here. So let me describe the architecture. Um, what you see here, 
Um, so there are two sides of this. You know, you have the web role side, which is doing the file handling and partitioning. And on the right hand side, you see the workers. And there is a task pool queue at the top in the center. And so the web role is basically parsing, finding out which one intersects what based on the bounding boxes. Every polygon has a bounding box, so you can actually simplify uh, identification of your task. And once you've done that, then you can put this into a task pool. So it's, it's, it's very much like a master-slave kind of architecture. Um, these polygons themselves could be thousands of vertices. So you really can't put everything, push everything on a queue. So you use the blob container to uh, create those tasks, and then the ideas go into the pool. Uh, as this is happening, uh, the workers actually check, keep checking, and they start consuming the tasks that, that come out. And then they um, produce their outputs, basic tasks, uh, polygon uh, intersections, back into the blob storage, and they put the IDs, completion messages, into this uh, bottom termination uh, queue indicator. And this um, web role will then, once it's done, will actually count how many uh, tasks are there, finish off, and then terminate. Um, so a couple of things to point out here. One is, of course, um, the two different queues. The queue that you're producing uh, at the top and the one that indicates termination, these had to be separate because uh, of the lack of FIFO nature. So, so really couldn't count on things not being there in the queue uh, for, for uh, detecting the task um, termination. Also, we could actually do um, a parallel I.O. kind of um, execution. When, when each task is getting executed, one can actually put. So there are, there are things actually which I'm, um, I'm reluctant to go into. So you can do block versus page. And in, you, you do have actually parallel access uh, to these blocks. So you can actually output into blocks. And then once everything is done, then that could be committed. So, so there is some fair level of parallelism available uh, within Azure for, for uh, creating these, um, writing to these files. We would love to get the same thing for input as well, but the input, of course, is, is something that you can't prepare. So that's available from the community. You read the input, and then, of course, you have to go through the whole thing. And that, that actually, I think, is one of the major problems here. Um, also, there is a problem in terms of supply and demand. The web role actually is supplying the task, and, then, and the workers actually consume they tend to consume much faster than what this can produce, even though we actually tried various size of um, Azure um, machines, virtual machines. So, so this uh, typically, what, what this could be actually, uh, could be eight core machine, whereas those could be a single core, you know, workers. Uh, but then uh, the producer can't keep up. Um, so, so to relieve this one, actually, we also tried uh, different other architectures. Uh, where we uh, do things which do, should not make sense, um, but, but then if you can tolerate that, that's fine. So, for example, we um, left the web role alone and let most of the tasks getting handled by the workers. So, so the workers in this case, uh, which, which we call static load balancing, um, they download and parse file, and they all download the same set of files. And that's, of course, an overhead. You're trying to actually you know, hit this um, uh, file system. And they create their own intersection graph based on these base layer polygons. So suppose there are actually 4,000 base layer polygons, and there are 4,000 workers. Then they each actually will find out the intersection for their only their own set of polygons. So so, so there is a nice ID based division, which worker you are and what chunk of tasks you are supposed to be doing. You can find out the intersection for that, and then of course then you do the um, actual execution of do the process, and then store exactly the same way. So, so there's a redundancy, redundancy here, and if you can tolerate that, then this turns out to be quite all right. Uh, also, notice that there is no dynamic task sharing. What you produce based on your ID is what you consume. And that typically works well for large number of things if they are fairly uniform. Then you tend to you know, balance the loads. And so therefore, this works fine for a general system. Um, it does not work very fine if, if you actually have a lot of skew in your load. So certain polygon, for example, uh, let's say a large hurricane swath, uh, will intersect a large chunk of land. And, and so that, that task actually, unless you further divide it, which is difficult, and that's one, one thing that we're looking at, will tend to consume too much time. So uh, we actually created a variation of the static load balancing distributed part to also do some dynamic load balancing here. So, so as, as they parse and uh, create intersection graph, they actually put all the task IDs back into a task pool. 
where then they start consuming from. Right? So, so, so there's a, another layer of overhead, although this can again be tolerated if you have enough to do, and then this uh, load balance actually offsets this extra overhead of uh, going through the task pool queue. Okay. So, so these are the three versions, um, the basic centralized version where the web role does everything, and the two distributed version where the workers do all the processing, where either you have the dynamic task pool or not. Okay. So let me share with you some of the uh, experiments on, on what we have done. So this, in fact, uh, I'll talk about two data sets. This is uh, one data set, uh, two files of these sizes. And they, um, the polygon layer, the base layer actually has um, about 4,000 polygons. The overlay layer has about 500,000 uh, polygons. And, and what this chart is showing is um, on the x-axis, you have the base polygons. Each polygon supposedly can intersect with so many. So in fact, there are some which can intersect with about 12,000 polygons. Uh, so if, if that actually is the task, then of course, the one that gets to execute that task is going to be heavily loaded compared to the others which actually had, don't have anything. So, the, so therefore, the, this is an example of a smaller system with a lot of skew in the load, and that's tougher to paralyze. Uh, as opposed to this, you have um, another data set which we are choosing to call a larger data set. Uh, has about 100,000 base layer uh, polygon and about 128,000 overlay uh, layer polygon. And then this is showing you kind of uniform load, okay, which you think that it should scale better, and it does. Okay. And so, so for this kind of um, input, which is what we expect to be uh, bulk of the input, uh, if, if the basic uh, even distributed static uh, version should work well. Okay, um, this one is actually going to create problem, and we'll see this. So here is some end-to-end -end speed up uh, data. Uh, the one that is skewed and small both actually tend to um, create problem. And so um, what this chart is showing you is different speed ups. The centralized, in fact, tends to saturate about at about eight worker roles, uh, whereas the dynamic load balancing uh, does better. But you see, notice, in fact, that we are trying to use a fairly large number of, excuse me, fairly large number of workers here. Um, so the last one, actually, uh, if, if you look at the x-axis, is 91 workers. So 91 workers actually are the ones which are consuming the task. Eight, nine workers are on the web role side, which are reading and also actually are doing the task distribution and so on. Um, so, so the speed up of 10 actually is, is um, is not very impressive, right? Um, but, but this actually is the skewed data scenario, uh, our bottleneck essentially. If, if you look at the larger data set, um, this is end to end speed up again, um, and, and this, this tends to scale very well. You know? so, so about one third efficiency, and that's decent. And, and we actually have uh, now newer data sets which are um, terabytes, and then we think that this should uh, scale much better. In fact, if you look at these two, the top two, um, the dynamic load balancing, which has an extra overhead of trying to go to the task pool, actually um, does worse. There's no reason to do this if things are fairly uniform. So, so even the static distribution, the blue line, uh, is good enough. So, so what we expect, actually, is that this would be the most common scenario where you have huge data set, but you're able to identify these independent tasks. That's actually what the overhead is. Um, and, and the file I/O, but beyond that, things scale quite well. So I'll, I'll actually show you how things are actually scaling. This, this is not telling you the whole whole picture, really, whole story. How much time do we have? Okay. So, so uh, this particular curve, uh, let's see, there's three sets here. So you have the centralized distributed dynamic and distributed static. Um, what to notice here in the centralized is, is this red line which is kind of, you know, uh, remains the same. That's the file I.O. Um, and, and other things. So what, what is coming down nicely is the, is the purple task processing time. That actually is also, um, it came down, but then again, it also saturates. So, so uh, the centralized actually is, is quite limited. Uh, down here, you have the static distributed version. Um, and then it actually gives you, um, and these are, these are small data. So, so th this is uh, scaling well. Uh, but then again, you can see this red part, which is actually the file processing part and the task creation part. They, they tend to um, come down and then again go up. Uh, the dynamic distributed on the top right corner uh, does fairly well 
compared to these two, and it is giving about tenfold speed up. Um, <clears throat> or the large data set, as you can see, um, the static down below here, everything scales very nicely except the only thing that I am showing you in blue, which keeps going up. That is the file I.O. So, so I think one of the things that we really uh, are looking for is a way to take these files and then maybe divide this somehow spatially. Things which are in this area will only intersect with that as opposed to the things which are far off. So how do we actually um, create some physical partition of these huge files which are um, something akin to what you have typically in a quad tree for example, where different quadrants have different areas represented. And so right now we are using GML files. There are other file formats which GIS scientists use. One, one of them in fact happens to be um, a shape file which is hierarchically arranged. So, so we are looking at that aspect which, which may address this. Um, let me skip some of these more details. Our paper actually has this. By the way, all of this code is available. As I was saying, this is a community resource now. Uh, we, we face, encounter a lot of problem trying to find these frameworks. Now that the frameworks are there, um, you know, we have put it out for, for everybody's use. Um, this, this exercise actually was not primarily um, in terms of algorithm research. It was primarily of engineering, how to engineer such, such systems. So we had a lot of trouble um, trying to um, design things, trying to actually discover uh, table versus blob, for example, which, which one is better, and, and the limitations, and the APIs, uh, the queue, the lack of FIFO behavior, how to even represent tasks and what to push, uh, serialization problem versus you know uh, just the textual uh, presentation in fact. So we tend to choose things which actually worked practically okay, which, which um, we did not think earlier should. Uh, even the simulator and the cloud environment, they are not faithful to each other. You see something running very well in simulator, you go to cloud and some library is missing. And, and so, so you tend to spend a lot of uh, cycles just debugging those. Uh, and then there are other issues. Uh, if, if you hit any of these stories uh, more than a um, certain number of times per second, they just collapse without any warning. And then so again, if you have this, so, so, um, and then dot net actually seems to um, say that this is fine. So, so we actually f figured out a lot of things and then um, this actually itself became a, a nice set of contributions. So, so actually the cloud uh, 2012 conference in, in Hawaii, they actually um, have just accepted uh, that part. Uh, let me um, just summarize the current and future work and see where we are. So, so essentially we have, um, a framework that we are able to use and that we expect to perform well for very large files, uh, roughly uniform uh, load, okay? where the coarser grain can work well. We actually have a, opened up this research problem in terms of how to paralyze things, and we have identified things which, which we really need to work on for a truly scalable, strong scalable, strongly scalable system, where, where things are uh, you really need to go into these tasks, which when I say here is a polygon intersect with that set of polygons, you are not actually using any parallelism there. So, so parallelization of the algorithm itself, using multi-cores and using actually GPUs as well. So, so uh, this is actually one of the key goal here and then we have fairly uh, good amount of ideas how to go about it and that is what we are working on right now. Um, and we also of course wanted to, since we are doing this in academia, we want to see how it is comparing with other environment. So, so we have the MPI implementation. We also have Hadoop implementation right now of this. Um, we actually also have benchmarked the Azure system itself quite well. And these are the papers that are appearing in IPDPS in Shanghai next month. In fact, this month. We are already in May now. Um, we are looking at even GPUs themselves to carry out these heavy duty computation at a finer grain. And so one of the things that we are doing right now is to parallelize our tree. Again, we have a good insight into it. So uh, two goals. One is truly scalable, strongly scalable uh, cloud system for GIS for skewed data. And that would be to actually do this on, on GPU itself. Okay. So th those two should be coming forth. Let me stop here. I'm going there. Hmm? 
So I was curious about something. When I talked to folks who were, you know, sort of generally in this space, so like in atmospheric sciences, for example, and doing various kinds of, you know, gridded computation, um, I hear that, you know, certainly the kinds of problems you express in terms of, you know, finding polygons and the computation involved with that is important. But a lot of times they're combining that with some sort of probabilistic mm -hmm. modeling, which involves something that's embarrassingly parallel. And so they'll do, you know, there's sort of a trade-off between like in weather forecasting, classically they're deterministic models, and the more modern approach is to combine that with probabilistic. So taking that into account that there's some part of this which is likely going to be embarrassingly parallel as well, that some of these computations are in parallel, do you have a sense about where you want to be in terms of how far you want to go with providing good parallelism for the hard parts versus just taking advantage of the fact that it's in a broader mix that has some embarrassingly parallel? So, so, so you're right. I think um, what has been easy has been done well. Uh, you know, so for example, raster-based uh, operations. Uh, that's actually one of the things that has been very successful, and industry has caught on as well. Um, and of course, you know, you can use this uh, in, in addition to some statistical um, processing. Um, depends on actually, actually what you're working this 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 off. So, so I think that's the research question. Uh, and, and, and I think many scientists actually that I talk to are interested in this, agent-based models and so on. So that, that's something that they're actually working on as well. Um, so, so good thing is that the raster-based operations are something that we don't have to worry about. I think the polygonal data is not going to go away, and that actually gives you information that you know, the raster-based is, uh, is not giving. And so, so it, they do actually have a real need for this. So we can't wish it away that, you know, so, so question actually was, was how much resources you're going to be putting into this. I think um, uh, it's needed, so therefore we'll have to put resource. It's going to take uh, some good research for, for good uh, systems to come out. And, and so um, I would focus on things which are harder as a, you know, as an academic community, uh, you know, to really uh, help out the commercial uh, systems here. I mean, that's what I would think, actually, right? Any other questions? All right. I think we everybody is now ready for some lunch. A uh, couple of notes. Uh, lunch is, is right out here. Uh, first of all, thanks again. Thank <laughs> you. Yeah.